Joe Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today I'm very honored to have the one and only Russell Five Nine on here with me. My brother, how you doing, how man? You it's, doing? A, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, man. Is I it love really? Your show. Yeah, really. Yeah, I watch your shit for sure. Wow, that's crazy to hear. You wouldn't think I would, huh? I don't know because you know. That's the weird thing about it. I've been listening to you for so long, and I listened to, I, you know, I listened to a lot of interviews last last night with you, and you know, you have such rapport with a lot of the people that are speaking to you because you've known them for years and years, mm -hmm. and it's always, it's weird to sort of imagine where the interview is going to go and everything when you're sort of coming into it from the perspective of sort of being an outsider but wanting to reach that level of rapport where you have, a, you know, a very real conversation. I get that. Mm. I get that. I get that. You you much taller in person than I thought you would be. I get that a lot. You like a bigger dude. I actually knew exactly what height you were going to be. You look like you would beat somebody's ass. Mm. You look like you'd beat somebody's ass. I thought you were like a little scrawny stoner. I get that a lot because, you know, I'm always talking so much shit on the internet, I feel like. But it's like nobody expects a guy to be big if they're loud mouthed on the internet, right? right? right, right but right. do you think you had a little bit of that in you that you were not as massive height wise? So it forced you to really focus in on the skill set you did have? Mm, no, nah, not necessarily. But I did get mis I get misjudged a lot. People mm. think that um, people have like a perception of me. Not so much now, but people used to have a perception of me before they met me. Mm. And I always, um, I was always accustomed to hearing, "Damn, I didn't know you would be this cool." Mm. I think people thought that I was angry all the time because you know, as an artist, when you only show them one layer. Mm. You know, they kind of sum you up to right. that. You know what I'm saying? Do you feel like a lot of that came from your time spent drinking? You think you had a different yeah. demeanor at that point? Yeah, I had a different demeanor. And when you're drinking, you don't really reflect a lot. Mm -hmm. You don't reflect a lot. You don't do a lot of thinking. So you go in the studio and you just kind of give them that one thing. You know, you talk about all the negativity. And it's like, you know, no one person wants to be summed up as that unless they're that. Mm -hmm. As a whole, right? You know what I mean. And if it's if that's just nobody's, I think Q-Tip may have used this as an example. He's like, man, I know y'all got mothers. I know y'all y'all not mad all the time. I know y'all not banging banging on breakfast. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, show people other sides. You know, show them everything so they don't just you know kind of group you. My boy Trick Trick, um, just because of like some things that he's done. People think that he's like this dude who's just like angry all the time. Just right. to, but he's a genius. He's a musical genius. He plays instruments. He engineers all his own sessions. He makes all his own beats. Right. He writes all his own raps. He's getting, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like, I just, I don't, when you, when people like lump you into like one thing I, and you can do many things, I think it can get frustrating at times. I know. I think about that all the time that you will see a rapper whose entire identity on a public <clears throat> facing level eventually will start to resolve around, revolve around certain incidents. You know, it's yeah. like I, I can think of rappers off the top of my head who maybe had to shoot somebody or some kind of crazy violent altercation that changes the trajectory of how people view them so fundamentally and ever but that doesn't necessarily really have anything to do with what else is going on in their life outside of that one incident yeah. where they maybe had to protect themselves yeah especially if it's something that's normally being glorified right on any other platform you know what i mean and people are like taken aback by that so that's that's what you are to them it takes forever. so much for somebody to really be able to, pres to to really make the masses pay attention to you changing your life like i always look at uh at uh, trey the truth mm -hmm. he's out there constantly fucking with the community he's one of our heroes to get to the point where people will now acknowledge that over any sort of aggressive behavior or anything else that he might have had in his mm -hmm. past now it seems like that's a big enough part of his image that you you couldn't have a conversation with Trey without talking about that. But right. you have to do so much positive stuff to outweigh mm -hmm. any little bit of negative stuff. Because the negativity is being glorified, and people seem to be more taken aback by that. Mm. You know what I mean? Like they're more intrigued by it, and it's just a it's a funner it's a funner thing to follow, and 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 it's a funner narrative to engage. I guess if you just live in a regular life, mm. and um, you know, if if the internet is kind of like your escape you know, to, to, to engage this fantasy mm -hmm. kind of world. And you don't even take into consideration the way this it's affecting the lives of the people who are actually in it. Mm -hmm. That's not a concern of yours, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's your escape. Right. But how does that, how does that feel for you at this point in your career where you're clearly like, you're not going to uh, cause some fake commotion between you and somebody else in order to sell records. You're not going to compromise your content. How does it feel that you still fit into the hip hop landscape when you're not willing to basically like drop in on and, and utilize some of the most basic like promotional slash ways to get people to pay attention to your music? It feels great. It feels great. And I'm, you know, man, I'm honored. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be in a position to where people even still care what I have to say, because I mean, it's, it's, 
the internet is noise. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's very difficult to figure out how to cut through that noise. Um, and to be able to do it with just ability, you know, man, that means everything to me because that's, you know, it's what I stand on. And it's the easiest, it's the easiest option for me. You know, like I've tried to do other things in the past. Um, I've, I've tried to engage BS, mm. you know, and it's just not, it's not my thing. It's not a, it's not a happy place for me. You know, I don't like negative energy. I don't like, I just, I'm just, I'm in a way, way better space when it's just peace. I've been to war before. Mm. I've been involved in the things that people glorify. I've actually had to live my life in these situations and mm. I don't like it. I don't like how it feels. I don't like anything about it. You mm. know what I mean? So I don't, I don't look to go that direction right. in situations. It's just not something I don't, I'm not into that like that. Mm. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, like, I feel like every Royce project, you're somebody <clears throat> who forces yourself to, to try to really branch out beyond the things that you've done previously. I've heard Royce projects that were like very much lyrical exercises. Um, your previous project before this one felt like it was really almost like you were forcing yourself to push at the walls of what you were comfortable talking about or really what like almost anybody is comfortable talking about in a rap song and that that almost seemed like that was the the standard by which you were judging that project you mean a personal you mean book of ryan the personal yes. the personal stuff yeah you know what i wasn't even forcing i wasn't even forcing it's it's um you know what happened man i um that was like the first project that I thought about doing when I got sober mm -hmm. and it was like, I think every artist needs to have that one project that kind of defines who they are. Mm. I think every individual needs to, especially artists needs to find a way to define themselves, mm. find that definition. Some people just naturally do it. Like my boy, Joe, he just lives it. Like he is, his, the definition of him should just be on his shirt. He wears it. Mm. And I'm kind of like drawn to those kind of people, like those self-defining people who know who they are. Um, and they are unapologetically that, right. you know what I mean? Like once you have a sense of who you are, then you should express that in your music because as fans, we want to know who you are. We want to get to know who the, who this person is that we're a fan of. Right. So usually artists do that project first. I did mine, you know, like in the middle of my career, mm. you know, cause I started off everything just kind of just drunk raps, rap, rapping about being able to rap, mm -hmm. which is my first love. Right. But you have to evolve into something else, you know, because once we get past the point of, OK, we established that you can rap. What else is there? Mm. You know what I mean? But so, OK, I saw in an interview previously where you said that with that you might never make an album as personal as that again. Mm -hmm. I, w with that being said, what mentality did you go into this project with? Like, what, what did you want? What ground did you want to cover that you hadn't previously touched, perhaps? Yeah. When you do it, when you do an album that personal, you um, generally want to just get it right that time. Mm. So you don't have to. You know, like, it should be understood after that album. You know what I mean? And if anybody who didn't hear it and they don't know you, you direct them to that album mm. if you want to know who the, guy, who the guy is. After that, you can be a vessel to do anything. I'm just, you know, every album, al album is indicative of who I am at the time. And right now, I'm, um, I'm a grown man. Mm. I'm a grown man in hip-hop, which is damn near taboo to be sometimes. I'm a grown man in hip-hop. Um, but you don't age. Hey, listen, listen. I, I feel like I age kind of gracefully, probably because I'm not trying to be young. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I think that the um, the older guys, you know, media and everything makes them feel like that they can't grow older in hip hop. It's nothing wrong with growing older. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, it's the dudes who feel the need to chase every last fan and they see Lil Pump getting a fan base yeah. and they want that fan base. Yeah, they, why? But, but you don't need to, like, if you can have hundreds of thousands of fans instead of the, the 20 million that this guy has for whatever period of time, mm -hmm. I mean, you should be happy with that and you should focus in on, I mean, if Griselda has shown us anything in recent times, it's that there's a huge value that you can build by being completely uncompromising. I feel like in a lot of ways, they're sort of like the spirit animals for a lot of rappers right now to be like, I don't have to compromise my content. Mm -hmm. I can be as hardcore as I want to be, and there are people who will love me for it. And the thing about them is they, they're kind of showing you that you can also still grow even bigger than what they're doing. Because mm. it doesn't look like they're at any sort of ceiling. Right. It looks like there's room to grow, you know what I mean? And if I know Gun like I think I know Gun, they're going to figure that out. And that's the beauty of watching the shit, you know mm. what I'm saying? And it's just like... It's much better to just live in the center of your truth. And the quicker you get to that self-defining moment is the quicker you can project that. And I think that's what they're doing. They're just projecting who they are. Mm. You know what I mean? And they don't have, you know, in previous generations of the music industry, there just would have been a lot more uh, pressure for them to do things that 
they're clearly not really incentivized to do at this point. Like, I'm sure there's nobody as shady that's like, we got to figure out the Griselda hit record. I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> it I might be a little it. bit of conversation, yeah. but I don't think that anybody yeah, thinks that's the. You know what, man? I think everything that's been considered special in our in our in our genre over the years. If you think about, if you think back to any generation, anything that's ever been considered special has always been that shit that's going a little bit left when everybody else is going right. Mm-hmm. It's never been anything that kind of like went with the flow. Right. Everything that's been considered classic has always been that other thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and um. I just think that's the mind frame that people need to be in, you know, like don't don't feel guilty for being different. If you're different, you know, like embrace it. Right. Embrace it and wear it and 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 give us that. Present us that because that's what we want. We want to know about you. There can only be one you. Right. And that's what makes you special. You know what I mean? Like when I first came into the game, I didn't think that people would find my story interesting because all the little nuances about my story we've heard before. Mm. So I just didn't think to tell it. It can be a challenge. Like, mm-hmm. how do you how do you present a, a familiar narrative in a in a way that feels new? If you tell it from your perspective, mm-hmm. if you tell it from your perspective, and you tell every detail of you, and we'll be able to tell whether you're copying somebody mm-hmm. or rather you're you're telling a story that we can relate to because we've been through it too. And a lot of it comes down to the details. Mm-hmm. It comes down to being extra personal because, that, I mean, and that is really a problem with so much rap music. If you were to listen to a thousand rap songs and, and come up with one common critique, it's that there's just not enough depth. There's not enough people giving you real experiences. It's just too much of people sort of relying on, on familiar tropes of just mm-hmm. saying the same stuff about having a gun and getting some pussy, et cetera, right. et cetera. And right. it's like, for anyone who makes it as far as you have into the rap game and still have that mentality of wanting to keep progressing i mean it just seems so i mean that's why like the themes on your projects seem so important yeah yeah i mean you know and i'm just um i get inspired by different things daily you know what i mean like it, it's it's with this project you know i i, I kind of fell into the process just by trying to learn how to make beats mm. you know and um it's just a testament to everything should just evolve around the art at all times you know like I feel like all of the all of the energy should be put into the art and then everything else that comes from it it sky's the limit on how many things that could be. Mm. You know what I mean? It could be anything. You apologized to your father at the end of the record for some of the stuff you said on the previous record. Mm. But was he in a lot of ways sort of the, the inspiration for the album in general because you have a lot of sort of old soul style street stories and just stuff along those lines it felt like you you in a lot of ways were trying to put yourself in his footsteps. I mean, my dad is, inspires me in every way you can think of. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a great man. He's a great man. He's a pride, proudful, prideful, proud man. And um, the reason why I apologize <clears throat> is because um, I f- when, at, us as artists, I don't think that we always think about how somebody else is going to feel when we, tell, when we speak our truths and other people are a part of those truths. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I feel like when you speak about certain things as an artist, you have to keep in mind how they may affect other people's day-to-day lives, whose lives, whose lives, day-to-day lives are maybe a little different from yours. Mm. So, um, my father's a little bit more private than I am. Right. And he's he's artistic. He's a, he he plays guitar, but he's not a visual. He's not a writer. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the a lot of those like characteristics and shit he just not gonna understand Mm. you know what I mean so and he's used to being able to control the narrative in a lot of ways so um I think that my last album it may have forced him to look at some truths that he would prefer to have a choice to look at and I got to take that in consideration just as the respect I have for him as his son so just on the song I'm basically just saying maybe I should have talked to you first before you heard this. Right. And that's what I was apologizing for. Not for the things that I said, because I didn't say anything that was wrong. Mm. It was just the way that it was sprung on him. You right. You know what I mean? So you, you've been doing therapy for a couple of years. Has your therapist ever pushed you to have your father in a session to, like, really get to talk on that level? Nah, because I don't... Um, all of my issues that I have, which are a lot... <laughs> all of them don't, you know, all of them don't point back to my dad. Right. You know, like, I have, um, I have a big general overall spectrum of things you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like i'm an alcoholic um you know some of the issues that happen with my dad they affect me in some ways Mm -hmm. um i would probably 
if I was to bring anybody into a therapy session, it would probably be my wife. Really? Yeah, because I, I kind of... You put her through a lot of it. Yeah, I put her through a lot, but I'm, I'm, I live with her. Mm. Post-traumatic me living with her after putting her through traumatic things. So um, if anybody needs to sit in a therapy session, <laughs> session with me, it's probably her. That's crazy, actually. To, like, Would you say from your outsider perspective that she seems like her quality of life has improved and changed a lot just because you guys have such a more steady relationship now? Like, are you Sometimes do you look at it and you're like, I can't believe we made it through the earlier part of our relationship given how much more hectic it was than it is now. Yeah, I mean, you know, technology, you know, the internet and everything has a lot to do with that. You know, um, because earlier on, it was a little bit easier, you know what I mean? But if you decide you want to live that kind of lifestyle, you know, messing with a whole bunch of girls and and, and then, you know, the girls started like getting famous based off of their affiliation with certain people. And then, you know, people's agenda started changing and everything started becoming a little way more agenda driven. And um, kids started to get a little bit older and um the wife's people watching, you know, seeing things. And it just turned into like this thing where it was just like, it's one of the things that drove me to get sober, man. Cause it was just like, it was just too much going on. It was like, um, internet thoughts, I guess you call them trying to like expose me. And you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I saw myself falling into a category that I never, I never thought I would be in, mm -hmm. you know? And I just, at that moment, you got to make a decision. What, t what kind of man do you want to be? You know? Cause my name is my name, man. If it's one thing, say anything you want about me, good or bad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, the last thing you can say is I just let anything just be on my name. You know what I mean? Like, my, my integrity is everything to me. It's way, it means more to me than money or anything. Mm -hmm. I can't have people walking around saying, he did wrong to me. Right. He did something wrong to me. I can't live with that. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like the closest thing to me, who was my wife, she's the closest thing to me. I broke her all the way down. Now she's looking to me to build her back up, but I'm holding baggage. I don't mm -hmm. have a, I don't have empty hands. You know what I mean? So it's a time process. It's a time process, and it's it's way deeper than just me saying sorry. Will you trust me again? It's, there's actions that have to take place in order for her to be back in that position, and it's a, it's a it's a work in progress. It feels like society's changing in a lot of ways, where men cheating on their wives is sort of starting to be viewed as more sinister than it previously was. It used to be that people just sort of accepted that rappers or celebrities were able to get away mm -hmm. with this, and mm -hmm. it feels like that sentiment is changing a lot. Like you are a fucking villain on social media. If you are in fact doing the <laughs> I stuff didn't know that. that we used to consider normal. Well, I mean, no disrespect to DJ drama, but he had this literally the exact thing you're talking about uh -huh. played out on social media over the weekend. Uh -huh. And I was just looking at this, like this would not have happened in 1995. Yeah. He would have been on a dartboard. This information would just not have been as easy to share. Like that the side oh, chick right, finds right, right, out right. about right, the I main you, girl you, and stuff, yeah, yeah. you know, having a relationship and keeping it private. I was saying, I'm like, how would the side girl have found out that it even wasn't a relationship? Is she going to go to the library and check out a bunch of issues of right. the source? Right, and try right, to right. find an article <laughs> about who's in a relationship. Like it just would have been so much more difficult now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And it's, yeah. The way that people look at cheating is way different. I'm glad, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that the double stand is it. I guess is it a double standard? Oh hell Cause yeah! Because it's kind of like there's never been a point in time where it, it it was considered cool to sleep with your friend's wife or mm -hmm. significant other. Right. We would never have done that. No. That's because we're loyal, right? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? If you're loyal to your to your friend like that, then why can't you be loyal like that to your wife? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Right. If anything, she loves you more because you'll probably fall out with said friend mm -hmm. at some point in the industry. Right. You know what I mean? But your wife is your wife, especially if she's been there. And I look at my wife. I mean, bro, we've been together since I was a kid, since high school. I feel like she's she gave up a lot of her dreams so I can chase my dreams in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. I feel like the least I can do is just be loyal. That's the bottom base least thing I can be is loyal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean... At, let me ask that. Like, it's a challenge, obviously, for you to come out and talk about, you know, Christmas morning when you were a kid and tell these really, really personal stories. Mm -hmm. But then when you also talk about, you know, that feeling of turning down a really good looking woman mm -hmm. and the, the sort of honor or the pride that you get out of that. Is that almost a weird thing to break down in music as well, where in rap music you haven't heard a lot of people sort of talking about how great it is to not have sex with a bunch of people? It, it was it wasn't really weird for me. But, yeah, um, 
it, it must maybe it was weird because you know like when I started talking about that I started feeling better about it. Number one about being different, you know, not going along with the with, with what everybody else is doing and what everybody else is saying because I feel like that's one of the reasons why I started drinking. Mm. I took my first drink at 21 years old with Dr. Dre. Wow. Just because I didn't want to say no. Really? Mm. That was your first drink. First drink. That's crazy. First. And was he? Was it a very big like drinking type environment in that in that it, moment? It, it was a party. It right, was a party okay. that he was he was doing for him for his birthday. Right. It was kind of private, but it was people there. It was it was like it was it was a it was a it was a little bit of a gathering. You okay. know? It was a festive environment. And were you right. someone who tasted that first drink of alcohol and you immediately knew that this was it? Nah. No, okay. no, nah, no. Nah, it took it took a minute. It right. took a minute. But you know, like when you become an alcoholic, especially in a business like this, you gotta you you, you probably want to think back to when was the first time? What was I thinking? What was the situation? You know, you got to kind of analyze it. You got to get to the root of it and figure out. And then once you're able to draw correlations between drinking and things that happened in your childhood, things that bothered you, think things that you thought didn't bother you. Mm -hmm. All of that came out in therapy. Mm. But, you know, I think that um, taking my first drink with Dr. Dre because I didn't want to say no, I think that's pretty telling. Right. Considering that I ended up becoming an alcoholic. Yeah. And, I mean, as a person who hasn't been drunk in the past couple of years, it's like giving that up, it just reveals so much to you. That mm -hmm. I used to really feel like I needed to be able to have some drinks to be able to hang out at a party. Me too. Or, and, and that just seems so bizarre to me now. Like I wish, I hope that somehow I could communicate to my kids down the road that you just don't need to, to rely on this and that there's no honor in being a part of this. That this whole drinking subculture that you think is a cool thing that you actually want to be able to relate to, you want to be a part of, that that's a terrifying thing to want to be cozy with. My father told me that. Yeah. That's one thing he did tell me. You know, he, he told me, um, you know, because he, you know, he dealt with some addiction issues um, as when I was a kid. And I remember going to rehab with him. Mm. And um, he wanted you to see that. Yes. Really? Yes. And he said, uh, he told me, um, you're not going to be able to do that like your friends can. Wow. Some of, Some of your friends can. You're different. So he knew it was genetic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He said, you're different. Don't don't do none of that stuff. And I said, okay. I didn't listen, mm. you know? So, I mean, that's one thing that he did to teach me. He knew he had the foresight, you know, so we don't always listen. Mm. We don't always listen. Sometimes we just got to go and we got to make those mistakes ourselves. Yeah, it makes me feel bad because my, my family doesn't really have a history of alcoholism and I was forcing myself to do it just because it felt like societally that was especially, what everybody else was doing. Especially in this business. Yeah. Especially in this business, we doing as the Romans do. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's I understand it, man. That's why I don't. I never come from a place of judgment when it comes to that, because I get it, man. I know all of those feelings. Mm -hmm. I know all of those feelings. I'm telling you, it was no pressure. It wasn't like Dre was like, yo, you got to drink with us. Right. No, come on, man. You don't look cool. No, he didn't do none of that. But to you at the time, Dr. Dre is about as yeah, cool as it gets. you don't want to say no yeah. to Dr. Dre. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So That's a fact. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so the overall, like, theme of the album, you call it the allegory, it's like there's mm. clearly a story they're trying to communicate from all these songs uh, together. Like, where did that concept come from, and what, what, what is the overall story? There's a lot of stuff that touches <clears throat> on race. There's a lot of stuff that's you sort of going back to, like, almost more, I mean, it's the Royce of 5'9 version, but it's kind of like street rap in a certain sense. Yeah, you know what I was, was kind of thinking? I wanted people to feel like that they're listening to... Um, just the original essence of just raps. Right. And I didn't want any one song to be so highly conceptual. I wanted um I wanted the canvas to be more splashes of paint than I've ever had on an album before. Mm. So like I'll touch on various songs and different different things in various songs in various ways. It's it's my most scatterbrained piece of art that I've ever done. Really? And it's 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 um Song lengths, some some things are short, some things are longer. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like it's not following any t any sort of traditional, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Any sort of cons traditional uh, structure. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's and and I figured out a way to make everything kind of connect together. You know, so it's something that you can play from top to bottom, and you can also skip through it. Mm. But if you listen to it from top to bottom, it sounds like probably the first time you've seen a Quentin Tarantino movie. Right. Like, it sounds like he directed it because it's just, it goes all over the place and then it somehow comes together. Right. So I'm, I'm speaking about a lot of my ideologies 
that I adopt, and I'm also speaking about ideologies that I don't adopt that maybe you should listen to. Right. Maybe you should. Maybe I'm putting it in front of you so you can see it. You know what I mean? I don't necessarily agree with this, but how do you feel about this? I wanted it to be thought provoking. I wanted it to be something people could listen to and start up a narrative, mm-hmm. hopefully a positive one. Right. Because like the, the second or third song you come in, it's called Dope Man. And it, it really like occurred to me. It was like, oh, OK, we're kind of getting to see like a Royce of 5'9 take on like a traditional mm-hmm. drug dealer song. Because he because he's being glorified too much, mm. you know, and um, I wanted it to come and go really fast. And I, did, I wanted it to be not predictable. Like people not know what the hell is gonna happen next on there. It's really, it's really. I'm really bit a little bit of a crazy person in the studio, mm-hmm. and I wanted that, that to kind of come across on this project more so than any one of them. Interesting. You know what I mean? So um, I, I feel like the first time that the dope man makes his appearance on the album, I wanted it to come and go, and then I wanted people to see the bigger picture behind the dope man. It's just like the first time you see the gunman in the movie. Where did the gunman come from? Right. We never cre- we never made any guns. Yeah. You know, this is this is provided to us. This is something that's been injected into our community and then they also come behind us and arrest us for being in possession of something that they that they put there. Right. You know, and this is I think that that's telling, man. I think that that's um that plays into the whole concept of the allegory. You know, information that you've been fed that you feel that you've been told is the truth. And then you find out that it's not the truth. Are you willing to unlearn the, the wrong information to take in the proper information? Right. Or is it easier for you just to believe, you know, what you've been told and not challenge anything? Right. It's all perspective, you know, and I delve into perspective a lot on the album. Perspective is intriguing to me these days. Like the, the dope man is the, the central figure in a huge percentage of hip hop, whether it's the, the rapper claiming to be him or mm-hmm. talking about them. And it's, it's very interesting because like for so much of hip hop history, it was really they were just treated like this icon, like this untouchable figure. You didn't see, you didn't hear a lot of discussion of the negative impacts of mm-hmm. dope man. But at the same time, it's it's not easy. It's not as easy as just saying like you know, people who sell drugs are bad and they fucking destroy communities. Which it's we could way deeper. We than could that. all agree with that. But it's <laughs> yeah. so much deeper to yeah. that in terms of how this art treats that pivotal figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of things are glorified, um, and they're glorified in a very uninformed way. Mm. You know what I mean? So um, the only way that we can kind of offset that is just to um, be be a little bit more informative if you have more information. Mm. Um, and, and let's figure out a way to to, to kind of balance things out because it's not necessarily in the best interest of the, the huge corporations that are putting the money up to market these things to you 24 hours a day. It's not necessarily in their best interest to balance anything out. It's you, just about the dollar to them. Right. Do, but do you think a lot about that in terms of uh, the the responsibility that the labels or the management companies have when you have artists who are basically being signed to perform the task of rapping about guns and drugs and then horrible things happen to them? Like, does that cross your mind a lot about the liability or the, the responsibility socially that those labels should be shouldering? All the time. All the time. I mean, I think about what we can do. I don't necessarily think about, honestly, I don't even really put the label in that kind of position in my mind mm-hmm. a lot because I don't have a lot of faith in those. And in, in right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's I a lot to ask of them. Yeah, I'm not really against the machine. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not there with it. Um, I feel like um, hip hop is in a good place and it's in a good place where I think like, I feel like everybody should be able to participate, you know, in the revenue stream, including the labels, you know, like they do their part, some better than others. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there are good people at labels. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of bad people at labels. Right. Most of them, I, to I, me. I would even just say it's like a bad culture in general when they are so incentivized to sort of prop up these young rappers that are talking about stuff that they would have heart attacks if their kids were talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's bad to me. Mm. You know you know what I mean? So it's like, um, but I, you know, I, I look to us a little bit more. And when I say us, <clears throat> I mean... Um, the artists and the people with a, with some sort of influence, more on the artist end and on the OG end. Mm. I feel like that there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a certain uh, we have a we there's a uh, what's the word? Why do we keep being at a loss for words? Um, there's a certain we have like a we have to we owe it we owe it to the next generation to give them information, give mm-hmm. them the information that we didn't have. Coming up, it's a responsibility, right? You know, and it's not something. Oh, if you do it, you're a pretty cool guy. No, you have to do it, right? You have to do it. This is part of it because 
being successful or being able to rap and provide a life for yourself, that's not free. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like right. part of being successful is helping other people. Right. Like we're, we're kind of past that, right? Like there, there was a certain time, I, I think about the camera on uh, Dame Dash, Bill O'Reilly uh, conversation that mm -hmm. they had on the radio. And it was the, very much Dame having this conversation of why do you have to focus on us rapping about crime and drug dealing? Like we made it out of the hood. Like we made something mm -hmm. out of ourselves. And that, that is good. But even at that time, I was like, there's, there's definitely something missing from this argument because yes, it's good to like elevate yourself to that point. But mm -hmm. at a certain point, you are going to be judged by the, the, the content that you've put out in there into the world. And if you can't point to very, very specific instances where you were blatantly honest about the long-term effects or whatever you're talking about, then that's kind of a hard conversation to have with certain people. Especially if they're not artists. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You can't expect them to just get you like right. that. I think Jay-Z is, is a good balance between the two things. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, him coming from being a drug dealer, him opening up about being a drug dealer, um, him evolving from being a drug dealer and now empowering people and employing people and um, doing positive things, I think um, that's a great thing because it's like it's now he made it to where you can't even call him like a drug dealer no more. Like mm -hmm. when the, when the Tammy Loren lady called him a drug dealer, we all we laughed. were appalled. You know, because <laughs> like, it's how like how could you? How could you? This is Jay Z, and it's like um, he grew to be much much more than that. And mm -hmm. I think that's a great thing. I think that's a great thing. Now it makes it to where that's not such a black eye in his past anymore mm -hmm. because he was able to turn it into a positive. In so many different ways, right? You know, like this guy has his own building yeah. in New York, his own building with all of his respective businesses on different floors, and I think that's something to be applauded because it, it started up. It started up with just some raps in his notebook, mm -hmm. and um, it's just a testament to you know like the level that this can be taken to. But you got to, you have to always want to elevate. You can't just stop at the point of saying, you know, I made it out the hood, right? You know, you got to help other people make it out the hood. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you got to, you know, like you got to wear that positivity and you got to indoctrinate it into the next person so they can wear that that positivity. And, you know, some of these cycles can get broken. Mm. You know what I mean? Because, you know, if you don't do that, then the cycles repeat themselves. And we're not really elevating anywhere as a culture. And this this culture is the world now. Mm. This is not just black culture in, in the hood, you know, like the hip hop has taken over the world. Mm -hmm. We are the culture now. Right. So we need to have more control than we have. Right. You know what I mean? And we need to not be so scattered out. You know what I mean? Like we need to come together and it's, as a collective, we can make decisions. We can have therapists at the labels. We can have health insurance standard in every record deal. We can have life insurance standard in every record deal. These are things that we have to come together and make standard, mm. tell the labels, this is what we want as standard. Right. And that's just us knowing our worth. It's us placing value on ourselves because they're not going to do that for us. When you look at Jay's situation, it's very clear that like he's creating his own world in which like the rappers, the people from the street who maybe were never able to harness this much power mm -hmm. are now actually like really he's building this insane thing that like yeah. it like having so much effect on so many different corporate levels and injecting his perspective into that mm -hmm. i mean and it, it's it's come about with him being for the most part like incredibly silent publicly mm -hmm. and letting you see very little of what's going on behind the scenes in his life but it's really incredible to imagine you know what what jay-z's label looks like in 20 years because right. it feels like it's I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's scary to even imagine. Yeah, and he's doing it with love. Mm. He's not doing it. He's not making you afraid of him. He's not doing it with fear. It's right. not a fear tactic. He's doing it with love. Mm -hmm. He's giving love. He's getting love back. You know what I mean? And um, I find it, I operate really well and effective when I operate that way. Um, I learned about myself that it wasn't meant for me to do bad things. Mm. My karma is instant. It's instant. So... When I just chill out and just tr try to live right, you know, nobody's perfect. I, I try to do my best to just live right. Things just work better for me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I felt like all the way leading up to that point, I was just having a fight with karma. Yeah. You know what I mean? Karma was kicking my ass and I was just trying to figure out why. What's going you're on? You're doing all this bad stuff. You know, not just like morally wrong, but you know, you're putting bad food into your body. You're putting all the drugs and alcohol into your body and then wondering why the stuff that's processed out of that isn't as positive as you'd like it to be. Right. It's like at a certain point, you just have to accept like, oh, 
if I sleep eight hours a night and I fucking eat healthy and I don't put a bunch of bullshit into my body, then the end result is going to be me being happier, more productive, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very strange that that's not intuitive to you when you're 20. Right. Yeah, because it's not to me. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't to me, to me at me. all. It wasn't to me at no. all. I didn't do anything right. At 20, and that's the scary years, thing so. is that your kid is going to like realistically, no matter how smart your kids are, is going to be a challenge to a certain extent to shovel that into their brain. But Bro, my, my son is so much smarter than I was. Really? I, I don't know for how I got so lucky. Mm. How I got so lucky because he he's 21 now and he got the worst of me, the worst years of, of Ryan Montgomery. He got mm. the worst years. I was not so present. You know, like every day was like I was trying to think of new ways to get out there into the streets and get some alcohol into my body. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So, and he turned out great. And consider. he sees the difference in you now. Like he's he's very much aware of how different you were then. Not not so much. Mm. Not so much. Do you manage to hide it a lot? Um, I thought I I, I think I tried to do a good job of hiding it, but um. My wife thinks it's just because he's a boy and not a girl, mm. and I think I agree with her because. My girls, my my girls are so intuitive, instinctive. They need to know everything. They want to know everything. They ask a whole bunch of questions, and they hear everything. Mm. They hear through walls. Right. You know what I mean? And the boys, you know, Royce, I talked to him. That's my oldest son. I talk, Anytime I talked to him about anything, it was always like, I didn't even notice. I was just on my Game Boy. Right. You, know, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of almost makes me feel like he's destined for great success because he was so good at blocking out tuned, all the shit around He just, he just tuned in to whatever he's <laughs> yeah. interested in, you know what I mean? I think about that a lot with myself, too. I'm like, man, there was all kinds of drama going on between my parents and shit. And I was so into my video games and my fucking Tupac CDs that it just <laughs> didn't really, like, drill into my brain that well. I mean, even the things that, that kind of bothered me, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just kind of compartmentalize them, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, if it's, if it's here, I just put it here. Right. And don't even look at it anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, of course, some of it came out in therapy later. Right. But still, suppressed feelings. Suppressed mm -hmm. feelings. That was a way of handling things as a, as a kid. Why was it important for you to include this, like, two-minute uh, excerpt of M giving his real thoughts about race? We had, a, um, we had a long conversation on the phone one time, and he said some amazing things. And um, I just asked him if he could... If he can, if he can talk about that again that we talked about. Oh, so that was original. I thought it was not, from an interview or something. Yeah, it was original. It was okay. original. But he, he, um, the conversation was much better. Uh -huh. The conversation was much better. It was, um, it's hard to recreate those candid moments, you know, because you know once you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say this, it doesn't come across the same. Even though it's great, it's great. But he said just so many things in this conversation. I was like, man, I wish you could say that again because it it goes into what I'm talking about on the album and what I'm doing with the album so much. And I don't think that people get these human moments from you mm. like this enough. And um, if people knew you like I knew you, like then they would understand a lot more with mm. the music, you know, in terms of, you know, people not feeling certain things and people just having their way that they want to hear him sound and they want to hear him rap. Right. So um, he was like, all right, I can give it a shot. So I sent him the music to talk over. And he talked for about 12 minutes. Wow. He talked for about 12 minutes. And then Paul, Paul Rosenberg kind of edited it down, you know, just so it can fit fit the album. Right. So um, he, when he sent it back to me, he still sent me some good pieces. You know what I'm saying? But just the conversation, I wish people could have heard that conversation. But the but the, the skit is a reflection of that conversation. Right. So, you know. Um, is it in any way a reaction to people still trying to paint him as a racist after all these years? Nah, he but well, he did that before. This is like that that whole painting him as a racist thing. That was like a brand new thing. That just happened like right before. Anytime M gets into a beef, though, they'll always try to revive that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it always has yeah. to come back. Yeah, yeah. My album was turned in. You know when that mm. when that when that came back up. So we that wasn't even like a topic of conversation. I still haven't even talked to him about um none of that stuff. Mm. But um, racist is one thing you can't. You can't paint him as a racist to me. Mm. You can't even talk to me about that. Right. And um, I'm not somebody who's a naive person. Mm -hmm. I'm not a naive person. I know what I know. I see what I see. And if I stand for something, that's why my integrity is so important. If I stand for something, if I stand up for someone, it's because I either know I can enforce it or I know I'm speaking from a factual place. Mm. And that's it. You know what I mean? So there's nothing, you know, anyone can say about Marshall in that regard to me. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, I feel like I moved to a city called Oak Park when I was a, when I was a little kid. 
And the first thing that happened to me when I got there was the day one, I got called the N-word by a white kid. And, um, you know, like just living in that two mile radius, you know, like if I never would have started traveling and I never would have met Marshall, I'm not so sure what my outlook on white people mm. just in general would have been, you know, because when you when you don't travel and you don't meet certain people, certain people don't get put into your life. Maybe you do generalize. And that's one thing that gets discounted a lot about racism is that, yeah, if you are racist, it has an unfortunate effect on the people that you are racist towards, but it also has an unfortunate effect on yourself because you are then closed off to people Mm -hmm. in the world. And it goes both ways, too. It's like I know a lot of people that realistically just have not had a lot of experience around white people, so it's almost hard for them to feel close to them. Yeah, and it's like um, they, they, they're they going off of what, what's, what's going on in either their neighborhood or something they've seen on TV. Mm. And can you imagine, like, how people must have looked at black people when all you seen with them as was the help <sighs> on TV? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they're still a slave on the front of the cream of wheat box, you know? Like, so if I'm forced to, to just assume and I'm naturally just a presumptuous person, who knows what I'm going to, what you are in my mind before I meet you. Right. You know, and a lot of people close themselves off to even be willing to change their mind even after meeting people and speaking to them. Right. You know, and then so it's it's meeting him and um, some of the things that he did for me and um, some of the ways that he wrote for me when he didn't have to and certain things that he did for me and just having long conversations with him and a long standing relationship and the way that he's handled certain things and the way that he just carries it in life. I know I'm talking to a person that's fair. You know what I'm saying? And he doesn't have to be fair. Mm. He grew up in an environment where black people used to just jump on him for mm. no reason. Well, it was for a reason. It was because they felt like he was trying to act black. Mm. You know what I mean? But that's the effect that hip hop had on white people back then, long ago, especially if you were drawn to it and you were like a historian. You know, M is a student of the sport, man. Like, he's a he's a master. He's not just a rapper. He's a practitioner. And it's not a situation where people are likely to try to uh, drum up some empathy for somebody. But imagine being a young Eminem, being so obsessed with hip-hop and so talented and having to find your way in that environment where no white person has ever really gotten respect in that environment before. Bro, I watched him get booed. Mm. All of that. It's tough. Mm. It's tough. But he weathered that storm. And when he finally got to that point where somebody was willing to give him a shot, which is Dr. Dre, he passed him the ball and he slam dunked it. Mm. Did some white privilege come with that? Absolutely. Mm. But Absolutely. he's always been mega conscious, yes, aware of that. Yeah, you know? and, and it's like it's like it just is what it is, you know. Like, but to say he's successful because of white privilege, oh, you fucking crazy. Mm. You're crazy. No, you know what I mean. So that's that. I mean, you know, he's a like I said, he's a practitioner. So he just he's to be that highly skilled. Success comes along with that. To right. put that much effort into something, to put that much work into something, to dedicate your life to your craft, there's a certain level of success that comes along with that. Mm, definitely. Um, so similarly, speaking of white people, where did this Yellow Wolf thing start? Um, there was something that happened that I felt disrespected by. You okay. know, and, it, and it's private thing. Yeah, it's a private thing, and it's um. One of the reasons why I felt so disrespected is because of what I thought our relationship was. Okay. You know, like I hold all my friends to a certain certain standard. I, ex- I have certain expectations from my people that I have love for, that I have relationships with. Um, and it's not many people. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like I'm running around just making friends with everybody. Uh-huh. So um, he did something. There was a window of time where he um, could have called me and just clarified it and just said something to me. And he didn't. And... Um, I just felt like that was disrespectful. I felt like it was disrespectful. And um, I had to think about it for a minute, how I wanted to handle it, because there were many ways that I could have handled it, you know? And I I was like, to air it out, and that's the reason why I'm not gonna air it out, but to air it out, I don't want it, I don't want any implications to be there that that it looks like I'm trying to like use it for some sort of like rollout or do something to try to, you know, like, you know, sell something to somebody or something like that. Was the original incident racial in nature? Uh, yeah, okay. it was ra- it was racial in nature, but it's predicated more in disrespect to me. Okay, you know, so um, with that, I also didn't want to come off as vindictive. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, I didn't, I, I wanted the way that I handled it to just be a, rep- a representation of who I am, who I am as a person, and that's why I kind of just laid it out there, 
and let them know that this is a this is a, a pass for all intents and purposes. This is a pass. This is something that I know happened, and I'm speaking directly to you. And then I'm going to leave it alone. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to I'm not going to give it any more energy. I'm not going to glorify it, any type of negativity, and I'm going to keep it pushing. That's it. But then he doubled down on the disrespect mm-hmm. on Instagram. Yeah. Called you uh, what M's fucking hype man, hype man, yeah. which I mean I'm assuming really probably didn't sit well. Yeah, I mean you know I mean it's it's um rappers say things you know what I mean and um but you said something about him and then he felt the need to basically react with yeah, more a, venom than you might have expected. Yeah, it's a chain it's a chain reaction it's a chain reaction type of thing. But you know sometimes if you get in a situation if. Sometimes you can talk yourself into a worse situation. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's why we got to be careful what we say. We got to be careful what we put out there. And that's why I um, was careful and made sure that I didn't put too much out there. Because I don't want the situation to follow me. I don't Mm. want it to be something where everywhere I go, I'm getting into a conversation about Yellow Wolf. You Mm. know what I'm saying? Like, he's not that fucking important, bro. It's like, it's 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 not even that serious to go everywhere and just talk about it and make it that huge of a deal. You know, like, um... He's not the last person who, you know, I've lost a relationship with. He's not the first person, rather, that, that I've parted ways with relationship-wise. And um, hopefully he'll be the last. <laughs> you know Were what you mean? ever cool with Kid Rock? No. No. So was that pri- – was he kind of doing his thing on an underground level before you in terms of Detroit, or was that around was the same a- time you just weren't fucking with it? No, I, I recognize Kid Rock as a legend okay. coming up. Coming up, But um, I, never, I never had a relationship with him. Okay. But so yeah. – does his career trajectory rub you the wrong way in terms of being somebody who really utilized hip hop to build a name for himself and then sort of rejected it and went in a totally different way? His his career, um, like just pushed to the side and not lumped in with a whole lot of other people who did that, doesn't bother me. It's not him isolated, right? But that thing that you you just said, like that thing, but rubs me the wrong way, right? And it's just a respect thing. It's like hip hop in general, like the way how embracing that our culture is. Mm. You can be green. It doesn't matter right. who you are, what you are. You can come into hip hop and build a beautiful life for yourself. Mm. All you have to be is respectful. Right. You know, it's just like somebody coming into your house and then just kind of like kicking their muddy shoes off onto your carpet. And you know what I mean? Like you just respect you respect the environment when you come into the environment, especially when it's so embracing to you. And um. You know, to, to just behind be behind closed doors and doing things that's respectful to the overall culture of hip hop is not right. Right. It's not right. And I, f- I definitely feel like Kid Rock is one of those people. You know what I mean? Like he kind of used it. He kind of used it and then kept it pushing. But it's not like I'm waking up every day and going, oh, man, I got to figure out a way to say something to Kid Rock. Because right. it's big. It's not really about Kid Rock. It's about that thing yeah. that he represents. Right. You know, and if, if there's too many people representing that thing. That's not good for the overall spectrum. Number one of where we are in America, man. Mm. You know what I mean? Aside from where we are in the hip hop, just where we are in America, man. Since Trump's been in office, it's like people are just getting super reckless with the with the racist shit. You know right. what I'm saying? It's like, it's like I, I don't I don't think I think his presence, his presence and then what he represents is not all good. You know what I mean? Just in terms of, you know, the, the like the racial side of things. Like I'm not a Trump hater or anything like that, but I think that his uh, selective honesty and um, his presence and just how f- outspoken he is and flamboyant he is, I think it has a negative effect on un- on misinformed people, right. uninf- uninformed, I think I'm racist kind of people. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, I mean, a lot of people who are maybe on the fence in terms of like communicating or expressing their racism have clearly been pushed more in the direction of being yeah. a bit more open just letting about it. Letting it go, it. yeah. 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 Yeah, just letting it go. I, I attribute that to Trump's presence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it's just a, it's a motivation for you. If you have a little bit of that feeling, there's probably all kinds of people that got a little bit of racism, but they don't let it bubble over to the point that they're on Facebook saying some crazy shit. But Trump is very much like encouragement. Because they might just be a little prejudiced. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they might just be a little prejudiced. I don't know if I classify that as racism. Racism mm-hmm. is more of a hate thing to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I hate him because he's black. Right. That's, that's racist. That's like... Damn, where, we can all we can all be annoyed. Yeah. You know, we all get yeah. annoyed. Like I remember, I used to go <laughs> jogging when I lived in New York, and it was just like I remember one day I was jogging. I was trying to get more and more annoyed by the fact that there's so many people on the on the the street. It was like mm-hmm. I lived in like a Hispanic neighborhood. Right, and nobody would move ever. You know, everybody's just taking up the street all the time. I'm starting to like get irritated enough in my head, and then I'm like, bro, 
it's just people. It has yeah. absolutely nothing to do with their race. Like, even yeah. as it started to, like, tip into your head, like, if you have, like, enough logic in your brain to be, like, it has nothing to do with, like, the types of people that are getting in your way. Because realistically, if I was running three blocks over, I'd be annoyed by all the Hasidic Jews in my fucking way, too. Yeah, so just magnify that and then imagine having a platform. Mm. So now it's just about social responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not about changing. It's not about not getting irritated. It's still okay to get irritated. Mm. Now you just got to be socially responsible. You got to be careful what you say. Mm. You got to be careful how you treat those people who are running on the sidewalk. Right. Especially if you're somebody with a name. Also, if you're, a white, if you're a white person running in Brooklyn, you probably shouldn't just assume <laughs> that the sidewalk is all yours. <laughs> when I look back on it now, I'm like, why did you think that the sidewalk, you could run in the street, bro. Right. Yeah. There's probably <laughs> rules against running on the sidewalk. Um so when you see Trick Trick, who you already mentioned, getting in on that Yellow Wolf thing, is that stand out to you as just like he's he's in the same boat as you, where he feels that there's a common level of respect that needs to be shown here? Yeah, there's a there's a common level of respect, and um, you know that's family, man. That's family, and um, I don't think I don't think he really got activated until he seen something that looked like a threat. Mm. We just don't he said the it. wolves might be coming yeah, for you. Man, like, why take it there, man? So unnecessary. That's crazy. So unnecessary. So, it, you know, it's, Trick Trick is always going to react like that if he sees a threat. You know what I mean? Like, we're family. we family. You know, we try to take care of each other. We try to keep each other out of, out of stuff. Mm. We were just talking about this. We were talking about um, how the hip, hip-hop climate in general, uh, we, we identify it now as just as flag football. Mm. It's flag football. And you don't want to be the guy out there with shoulder pads on. Right. You know what I mean? So it's not, you don't want to just be getting, taking everything so personal and getting so bent out of shape about everything. You know, so, a lot of times it just doesn't look right when you're the one who's getting extremely aggressive because there's, yeah. there's such a, a thing about being like triggered or mad. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to be the guy who reads as mad mm -hmm. unless you have a really, really good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mad is not good. Mad is not good. Especially people just want to be entertained most of the time. You people know? like to see that you can weather the storm of public attention. That's one yeah. thing that people really seem to take pride in as somebody who's never really that moved in terms of being offended mm -hmm. or even if they're just acting like they're not that moved. Mm. You know what I mean? Sometimes that's just the best that's just the best method. I I personally feel like I can after all these years in the game, I feel like I can get along with anybody, man. I feel like I can be cool with anybody. Mm. You know what I mean? Like there's I don't require much. I you don't have to salute me. You don't have to um you don't have to uh, recognize me as any sort of legend. You don't have to give me any props. You don't even have to respect me. Just don't disrespect me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if you disrespect me, that's really the only demand that I have. Other than that, like, you don't have to even acknowledge me. I, I'll be out of your way. Mm. But if you disrespect me, then I'm, I'm going to enforce that 10 times out of 10 times. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'll never, ever abandon because I just feel like, you have to be in the mind frame of drawing your line. There has to be a line that people can't cross. Otherwise, people will just walk all over you. And mm. you could never be successful getting walked all over. But is there a part of you that feels like at this point that you almost just don't even have any reason to be involved with newer rappers or even give a fuck what they have to say about you and stuff? Like, there's so many generations between you and stuff, and it feels like the younger generation is doing something that's so different from the thing that you grew up doing? If I tap in, it's just to help. Mm. That's it. I'm not, I'm not tapping in to judge. I'm not saying negative things about people. If I don't have something positive to, to post about somebody, then I won't post about them. Mm. You know, so if I if somebody asks me about what the youngers are doing, I'll give my opinion if I have something good to say. If if I don't feel like it's good, then I won't speak on it. You know mm. what I mean? And um, that's what I feel. I don't I don't I don't I don't ever feel like we should get to a place where we just kind of like throwing our hands up and just letting the youngers do whatever. I feel like the OGs kind of did that with us, mm. and uh, we suffered from it because you know we 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 had to navigate and we had to learn things through trial and error, mm. you know. And I don't, I feel like the youngest today have even less information. Right. So we have an obligation as OGs to kind of like curve that to keep the keep the cycles from repeating. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's just so many interesting styles coming out of Detroit in general that there's this whole sort of like, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but like scam rap. It's mm -hmm. like sonically, there's like a style associated with that and stuff. Is that something that you pay a lot of attention to in terms of what's going on in Detroit? I don't pay a lot of attention to it, okay. but I, I'm aware that it exists. Mm. You know, um, I'm not really that into it, you know, um, but, but I'll support those guys just for the simple fact that they're from Detroit, mm. you know, and it's, it's, it's talent and all of that shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like we're living in a world now where you don't have to listen to nothing that you don't like. 
You know, like it's not like the days where we used to have to go to the radio to figure out what was hot. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like you can live, you can build an ecosystem around yourself as a fan and just only listen to and take in the things that you're interested in. Mm. You know, um, in terms of me just being an OG from Detroit and looking at the various styles that are getting light shined on them, it's my job to support it. It's my job to support it. I don't have to listen to it. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. I don't have to, you know, like because some, some things come and go. You heard that Boldy James album? I did. Fire. Always. Classic. Always, man. Boldy is like, man, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before he's uh, he's getting his just due. But people like him don't generally cut through first mm. because he's unapologetically him. He's one of those people who he's, he did what I, what I was just telling you about at a younger age. He he. He he f- get, found that self-defining moment. He knows exactly who he is. He knows how to verbalize that, and um, he's everything that he says he is. Yeah, you know what I mean. And that's a rarity. I asked him. I'm like, you know, you're the only uh, rapper who's like putting out an album and their Instagrams on private. And he's just basically like, man, I lost a password. I can't find the password. I don't really give a fuck. And he's telling the <laughs> truth. <laughs> Like, that's that's Bodie. a critical way of you promoting your album, just <laughs> for the record. But you that's know, Bodie, bro. I understand. That's Bodie, bro. And Bodie is somebody he can come. He just came to my studio a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. and um, he comes to the studio. We never get music done because you, I, he just starts talking, and that's it. Just let him talk. Him, Bodie, and DJ Premier are two of my favorite people to talk to, really, in the business because I don't have to do a lot of talking. Mm. They do most of the talking, and I'm always highly entertained by whatever they're talking about yeah you need those people in your life yes yes because a lot of people some some people have just that automatic monologue you walk into a room with them and they just start telling you whatever it is like some of the dudes in my girl's family she's like armenian i mean you walk into the room and they just start telling you every single thing that there is to say (laughs) about their business or whatever and sometimes forces me to think like i got a lot of interest in shit that i could be talking about to all kinds (laughs) of random people but here i am keeping it to myself right you know right yeah it's like an old soul type thing when you when you realize that there's certain people who are not so focused on their career that they're just mm-hmm. airing out whatever the fuck they feel like talking about. Like you, you might be a little too busy if you're veering away from those conversations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, lo- I love those dudes, though, man. I love those dudes. Definitely. Um, what what made you on that that same song we're talking about that with the Yellow Wolf uh, reference? What made you want to stand for Cash Doll and just let her know that she's fire? Well, the fact that I think she's fire and um. It's a it's a it's a Detroit thing where I feel like we need to support each other a little bit more, especially when it's uh when it's something that wouldn't be expected. Mm. I don't think people would expect me to um stand behind her like that. And um people aren't used to seeing us stand behind each other like that. And I had never met her. Never met her before. Mm. I had never met her before. And I just wanted to show her that I support her, and I wanted to show the world that I support her, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I do that with a lot of different artists in Detroit in a lot of different ways, you know what I mean? And I just feel like it's kind of like my job to do that. I probably, I'm going to be honest, I probably would have never listened to her if I hadn't heard them talk about her on Joe's podcast so much. Mm-hmm. Good. They're always clowning on Maul, acting like Maul's like a huge, huge fan of her or whatever. He in love with her. <laughs> that <laughs> that, that made me be like, all right, I got to go listen to this, see what this is all about, yeah. Yeah, but she fired though, man. She yeah, fired. She fired. And then you know, she she's thorough. You know what I'm saying? Like I I heard about her a long time before you know everybody else did in the world. You know what I mean? Like just locally, she had a reputation for just getting money. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like she's she's thorough. She's thoroughbred. So I feel like somebody that authentic needs to be needs to be supported because the way she represents Detroit, she represents us well. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So she's a good she's a good spokesperson to be out in the forefront. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, when you said that the uh, the only Gucci you fuck with is Radrick Davis, one, have you previously uh, spoken on your admiration for Gucci before? And number two, what is it that still got you tied closely to the the Gucci boycott per se? Well, I mean, I don't I don't know Gucci man like that. I don't have that much of an admiration for him. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just it's just it's just um, when you say Gucci, he's who I think of. Mm. You know what I mean? He exists. He exists to me because um, he's he's good at what he does. You know what I mean? Um, he's authentic, and um, I like what he does. I like what know? he represents right now. There as you a go. Mas- massive, there you long-term go. fan, but also when you look at him right now and you're like, wow, that is a guy who not only seems to be at a great place in his life, but is communicating that through his fitness. Good. Like, crazy. Yes, yes. And I, 
I'm definitely a fan of that. And, um, you know, Gucci, listen, I operate under the edict. You're guilty until you're proven innocent when mm. it comes to that. What they did, what Gucci did, they're guilty. And I'm not so forgiving mm. with that. I'm not so forgiving. I didn't get a sorry or nothing like that. And I'm not, I'm not going to be protesting and I'm not going to be outraged. Mm. I'm just not going to support. And that's my right as a, as a, um, as a previous consumer. There was a point in time where everything I wore was Gucci, and all I did, all I did was promote that. Right. I called myself the Gooch on Twitter. <laughs> everything I wore was Gucci. I was dressed really ugly. Right. But still, everything I wore was Gucci, and then Gucci was like my thing. So you know, when they did that, it stung. It might be easier to give them a pass if they had been fucking with all the rappers who were supporting them for like the last forty years. Yeah. Yeah. You know? True. True. But I mean, you know, it's cool. I'm not like I'm not like mad at them or nothing. I'm not like. I would never go into the Gucci store. I still wear some of my Gucci glasses. You know, I'm not like scarred for life or anything right. like that. But it's like I'm just making the decision as a consumer to, you know, like take my money somewhere else. I, you know, I want to put my money somewhere where it's appreciated, man. Right. You know? Yeah. And it's pretty, it's honestly like the, the decision to not be constantly buying, you know, $800 sneakers mm -hmm. and $3,000 hoodies and shit. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard of a decision to make. It's <laughs> right. actually a pretty easy decision it to make is. if they give you a little bit of a reason. It is. I saved a lot of money making that decision. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> How did you uh, connect with uh, G Perico and Vince Staples to do that one song? Is that the, the most West Coast song you made in a while? Yeah. YB and Corday was originally on it instead of Vince. Wow. Where yeah. did that, the decision to swap them out come from? Um, and was that a Dre connection? Mike Karen from Atlantic. <laughs> oh, he didn't want him on it. I don't know. I don't know. I know it was just at the end of the day, we couldn't clear him. We oh, couldn't clear him at the end of the day. So um, G Perico is somebody who I just reached out to because I just, I was a fan. He's great. He's new. I'm a, I'm a fan. Uh, he has a jerry curl. No, he does, yes. And I think that's the most incredible thing. I'm like, why didn't somebody think about that? Or you look that at him earlier? with the, the jerry curl, you're like, why doesn't everybody have a jerry yes. curl? That's a great hairstyle. That's fucking crazy. So great. I'm like, so you know, that voice and the way he just approaches the beat, the pockets that he uses, I love that kid. You know what I mean? So I was like, I'm going to work with him. You uh -huh. know what I mean? And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to wait till he blows up. Mm. I'm going to work with him because I want to work with him. I'm going to work with him because I think we can make a good song. Right. I don't think enough artists do that. So um, I reached out to him. When we lost YB and Corday, which was heartbreaking, um, I reached out to Vince on a whim. You know what I mean? I've always been a fan of Vince. I always uh -huh. love Vince. You know what I mean? But I, I didn't know if I'd be able to get him in such a, in such a, it was like a time crunch. It was right. like. We sent it to him, and he, he had, like, a couple-day window to do it, man, and he got it done for me. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, big big shout-out to Vince. I love Vince. That's you know fire. what I mean? Yeah, he's incredible. Um, okay, last thing I want to ask about that I was supposed to ask in the beginning. Is this the, the skits or the, the audio clips that you keep using of the father sort of teaching his daughter about life? Mm -hmm. Where did that come from, and is that is that kind of the theme that you wanted to project upon what this project was, is that you were sort of arming people for their yes. life experience on the way? Yeah, but I'm, I'm arming people, and um, it's a guy named Derek Grace. Okay. De Derek Grace, you may have seen him. He's kind of big. He's kind of big dude with the tattoos all over his face. Oh, okay. Very, very informed. Okay, so that dude, what those skits taught me, and I told him this when I called him to see if we can get it cleared. I thanked him for inspiring me to look for those teachable moments with my kids. Uh huh. You know, he didn't necessarily inspire me to teach my kids how to use, you know weapons, you know, but he inspired me to find those teachable moments because my dad was a very good um, disciplined guy, you know what I mean? He was very good at disciplining and reprimanding, you know, and letting us know when we did things that were wrong, you know, but um, I think there's a flip side to that, you know what I mean? I think that there's, um, there's not enough moments where we're looking to teach, where there's no kind of disciplining going on, it's just teaching. Mm. It's just teaching, you know what I mean? And um, there was a long period of time where I just assumed that my son knew things. Mm. And it, usually he didn't know. So I had, to t I had to tell myself, check myself. Like, if I didn't teach him, why would I just assume he would know? So mm. I have to teach him. Just like with my daughters, you know, I let her teach them. Like, certain things that they need to know about being a woman, I let her teach them. And certain things to know that Royce, certain things that Royce, my son, needs to know about being a man it's my job to teach him, mm. you know? So um, I just, I, I got a lot out of him just teaching his kids and just how astute they were to detail and just listening to everything that he had to say. It's like he got little robots, you know what I'm saying? I love that, I love it. So, you know, I felt like I wanted to use it and I just put music under it, 
kept it pushing. No, it's so true. It's like not just your kids, even just the people who are around you. It's very mm -hmm. easy to forget that a lot of the, the basic lessons that, that you now consider basic about business, about how to carry yourself, the kind of jewels that you could give somebody that might just be like a quotable, that might just stick in the side of their fucking head mm -hmm. just because you are who you are and you're... Yeah step into them and giving them a piece of advice i mean that's infinitely valuable and it's very easy to sort of get into the mentality of assuming that everybody else is on all the same shit that you're on mm -hmm. absolutely man mm -hmm. i 100 percent agree with that man yeah so I'm, i mean and, and two just with my kids you know this dude with his kids i was listening to and watching those videos for a long time and it was something when we were doing the album where i just was like you know what i wonder if i can put some music under this you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying and i tried it i loved the way that it sounded and um, it started to add to the theme, and I just kind of went with it. You know what I mean? I just let it flow. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Did you, uh, the rhinestone do rag is not actually as easy to Google as I think you probably assumed it was. You never saw the rhinestone do rag? You know, it was like a meme for a while, just sort of. You never right? saw the rhinestone do rag? But you, but there was an old photo of you in a rhinestone do rag? Yes. Yes. That's, I, Plenty. I, I remember it. I just had a harder time Googling it the other day. Well, maybe I certainly don't have <laughs> anything to do with it. <laughs> With it not being on the internet, I didn't. I'm not, I didn't go and say, "Yo, get this snatched down from the internet." You know, it's part of my past. Mm -hmm. I embrace it. I'm not even embarrassed by it anymore. But that's the rhinestone do rag turned into a thing now. So it's bigger than just the the, the do rag itself. It's that thing that we do as younger artists where we're just being accepting. Mm. The rhinestone do rag came from me thinking that I needed a stylist. They told me that I needed a stylist. All artists have stylists. Mm -hmm. So I thought I needed a stylist, and then she came through and she su she suggested the rhinestone do rag, and I said okay. Yeah. And then I didn't realize until years later how stupid it looked. <laughs> looking at, looking at right. it in retrospect, you know what I mean. But, so, but compare that to just all the dumb fashion trends throughout all of history, and you know, it's just a, there's an extent to which you know that a lot of the stuff that's popular right now is just gonna look stupid as fuck in a few years, and you can try to gravitate towards more classic looks. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think in a couple of years we're gonna look, think that your suit looks crazy right now. Yeah, but the rhinestone do rag never was an end thing. It never really worked <laughs> even at the time. <laughs> I believe that. It never was an end thing, bro. It was just my own stupid little thing that I did. It would, never was a cool thing, bro. I feel like a lot of rappers have had the, the moment where they have to learn from the stylist experience. Because there was that thing with, with uh, J. Cole where he went to an awards show and he was wearing the same Versace hoodie as three other people. <laughs> and he's, that was like a huge thing for him where he's like, I don't want to be wearing the oh, same fucking man. sweatshirt as everybody else. Like, this is just not me. That shit's Gar Cole for life because he, he just, he, he just, you could tell he just don't even wear name brands. Nike no Tech ever since. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. That's dope, crazy. Bro. If you get to the point where you can pretty much just dress like you're ready to go to the gym, <laughs> yeah. whatever. That's hey, he you made dressed, it. You dress like an NBA player at Lifetime Fitness. I don't blame him. It's athletic gear all the time. That's a good look. He probably is on his way to the gym anytime anybody see him. Anyway, right, all, yeah. all he does is play basketball and go to the studio. He's so. on the way. I don't blame <laughs> right. him. Uh, Royce. Amazing album. Thank you, brother. Much respect. Thank you. Thank it was you, a man. real, real honor to get to sit down with you as well. Man, honor and a privilege, brother. Thank you. Thank Pleasure you so to much. meet you in person, too, man. Thank you, Gene. Everybody out there, the album is out now. Go get it. Royce the 5'9". Peace. Legendary. Appreciate y'all. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, and subscribe. NoJumper.com if you want to support. Yo, what up? This is Royce 5'9". You can like or comment this video and make sure you smash that subscribe button. Peace.